that is that we can see Barhaven. What? It's crazy. Anyway, what time is it? Oh, it's right on the money. <laughs> I'm going to do a roll call now. So, um, so we, uh, no, hang on. I've got to, I got to get organized just a minute. I got to get myself a pen. Screen. All right, so I'm going to call for quorum of the uh, planning committee members. Um, Councilor Brockington. Morning. Morning. Councilor Cluche. Present. Councilor Dudas. Present. Councilor Hubley. Councilor Kitts. Here. Hi, Catherine. Councilor Leeper. Bonjour. Councillor Moffat. Here. Councillor Suds. Here. Councillor Tierney. Present. Is Councillor Alshantiri joining us today? I think I I, um, I forget what he uh, said. I don't see him right now. Vice Chair Gower. Here. And I'm here. Okay, well, we definitely have a quorum. This is a public meeting to consider the proposed comprehensive official plan and zoning bylaw amendments listed as items one to four on today's agenda. For the items just mentioned, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal if council does not adopt an amendment within 90 days of receipt of the application for zoning and 120 days for an official plan amendment. To submit written comments on these amendments prior to their consideration by city council on June 23rd, please email or call the committee or council coordinator. And in our case, we have the great good fortune of having Ms. Melody Duffany. And if anybody has any motions that they haven't presented yet, if you would uh, kindly uh, send them over to Melody so that we can all see them, that, so that the delegate, any dele delegates can see them, and of course the applicant as well. Are there any declarations of interest? No. Nope. Uh, confirmation of minutes from the May 27th, 2021 meeting. Is that carried? Carried. Okay, so I just want to talk to you a little bit because we've been, you know, uh, we were pioneers uh, in Ontario, at least if not beyond, in sticking to the business of planning our city. Um, when COVID first um, shut down many things. March 16th, I think it was, um, of 2020. And um, we really set the bar for how other people could go proceed. And we're always looking at how we can make it just a little bit better. One thing that we do know for sure is that more people have been able to join us and participate in their city uh, than ever before. Uh, you know, the, when you think about it, all the people who were, um, you know, we used to hear, you know, well, my paratranspo didn't bring me here on time, didn't pick me up, didn't, never came back to get me once I was finished my, uh, my delegation um, me, uh, speaking. And, um, you know, parking, childcare, all of those things. We just, we really have a, a dynamic um, group of different people now that are participating. And that's great, but you know, how can we make, they also are new to the planning process and, and how can we make it um, more transparent for them on what we're doing? So after the last meeting, it got me thinking because um, we received a, a question from somebody saying, well, I waited for this many hours and then, you know, I, I spoke and then I didn't know and there people had their, didn't, weren't showing their faces and they weren't doing this. and. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even know that the vote happened, you know, and so the lingo that we use like carried, what does that mean? So it got me thinking and I, I had a little chat with Melody and then I, I talked to Caitlin, um, Salter McDonald, and I said, you know, how can we, you know, here's some things I'm thinking about. What are you thinking about? Take it back to your team that, uh, you know, works all of the committees. And then I went to all the chairs uh, of the uh, uh, standing committees and said, you know, what do you guys think? Even things like we don't have commonality in the start time of the meetings or when the last, but you know what, I'm just gonna read my notes because I'm probably talking about some of them and you know, 
they prepare these things for me to make sure I don't skip a beat. So um, registration deadlines for delegations. Since moving to virtual meetings in 2020, each committee agenda has included an annex that provides the remote participation details for members, staff and the public, which includes details on how to submit written comments prior to the meeting and the associated submission deadline, how to register to speak as a delegation and the associated deadlines for that, how to submit visuals, presentations to be shared with the committee during a meeting and the associated deadline to provide them to the coordinator. However, the city clerk's office has advised me that the instructions and deadlines in that agenda annex have varied slightly between committees. So to avoid confusion in this regard, the instructions and language in the annex has been updated and standardized to provide additional clarification to delegations and we will all use this approach going forward. So thank you chairs for your um, concurrence. Specifically delegates must register with the committee coordinator by 4 p.m. on the last business day before the meeting when registering by phone. Delegates who want to provide visuals while they speak must also register and provide those visuals to the coordinator by 4 p.m. on the last business day before the meeting, as it has been from the beginning of these remote meetings. Delegations who do not want to present visuals can register by email up until one hour before the meeting. And this is a big difference in that because we were half an hour before the meeting, uh, arguably, and usually with the largest number of people coming out to speak, depending on what the, the items were. Um, and so um, some people were cutting off uh, sign up the day before. So we will all be um, um, respecting the one hour before the meeting time. While we were previously allowing delegations, like I just said, and in fact, for one in-person meetings, we were permitting signups right until the meeting started. We have discovered that remote meetings are more complex with all of us in separate locations and with varying technical challenges. Closing the registration for speakers an hour before the meeting will provide clerk staff time to update the speakers list, communicate it to the chair and members, provided the provided this Zoom details to participants and support all participants in joining the meeting and dealing with any technical difficulties. And as always, the opportunity will remain to provide written comments after the stated deadlines up until the matter is considered by council. Second thing, calling a recorded vote on held items. So this is aimed at ensuring delegations have a clearer understanding of awareness of our decision process at committee meetings. While some delegations make frequent appearances at committee and have a working understanding of our terminology and procedures, others do not and may be new to the process or have difficulty following our lingo while adjusting to the nuances of a remote meeting particularly in those instances where meetings have multiple delegations or lengthy debates, it may not be clear to some what has happened after all that discussion when the committee agrees that an item is carried if we don't take a recorded vote. So some may also question whether there were enough members present to carry an item if various members have their cameras off when an item is carried, as they may need for technical reasons, and especially when that action is taken hours after the initial roll call. So in consult consultation with the city clerk's office, I intend to implement a practice at planning committee whereby I will call for a recorded vote, in other words, yeas and nays on held items. So only on held items, where there has been significant discussion or delegations. I do not intend to do this with every agenda item, in particular those during the consent agenda following roll call, but where I sense that extra clarity might be needed for the public, I will ask for your indulgence. And of course, the procedural bylaw allows any member to call for a recorded vote on any item, as you, as you are aware. So let's get on to today's work, but I hope... Uh, Send me a note after and let me know um, what you uh, what, what do you think this is a good idea, okay? What your thoughts are. I mean, as you know, too, when I talked about the technical issues, I mean, how many times have you heard me say, well, you know, are you in Barhaven? <laughs> because it's so awful. So there's that consistency. So sometimes I don't have my, my screen on either. Uh, the first item before us today is the zoning bylaw amendment for 1800 and 1830 Trim Road. Uh, we're not having a presentation. We do have a speaker and we have the applicant here as well. So we'll have to hold that item. The next item is 180 Metcalf Street. 
And we have no one here to speak um, as a delegation. We do have the applicant here. Does anyone have any questions on 180 Metcalf? Okay, so uh, to Bria uh, Aird and Paul Black from FOTEN, um, are you needing to speak if we're prepared to carry this item? No need to speak, Madam Chair. Okay, well, thank you. So on the zoning bylaw amendment for 180 Metcalf Street, is that carried? Carried. 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 Thank you, everybody. The next item, um, we have a technical amendment on this one. It's the zoning bylaw amendment for 78, 84, 86, and 88 Beechwood Avenue, and 69, 73, 77, 81, 85, 89, and 93 Barrett Street in, in uh, Councilor Fleury's ward. And we do have a couple of speakers, uh, as well as the applicant. So we'll hold that. But um, uh, Vice Chair Gower, how about introducing that technical um, amendment so that we have that, the technical amendment? Yeah, uh, so it's a... It's a technical amendment regarding the maximum residential use area within a building, uh, which faces Barrett Street. So whereas the report recommends a zoning amendment to bylaw 2008-250 to permit a nine-story mixed-use building at 78, 84, 86, and 88 Beechwood Avenue and 69, 73, 77, 81, 85, 89, and 93 Barrett Street, and whereas staff have noticed an omission in the details of recommended zoning document two in relation to the permitted maximum residential use within a building which faces Barrett Street. And whereas the current zoning allows residential uses within a building which faces Barrett Street up to a maximum of 50% of the ground floor area, while the development application calls for 80%, therefore be it resolved that the details of recommended zoning in document two be amended to add item 3B8 as follows. Clause 1988 does not apply. Residential uses within a building which faces Barrett Street are permitted to occupy a maximum of 80% of the ground floor area and be it further resolved that no further notice be provided pursuant to subsection 3417 of the Planning Act. Thank you. So we'll deal with that when we come back to that held item. Uh, item number four is the zoning bylaw amendment for 4275, sorry, 4725 and part of 46. 23 Spratt Road. That's in um, uh, Councillor Meehan's um, Gloucester South Indian Ward. We don't have anyone here um, uh, registered as a delegate. We do have uh, Vincent Denime here from Clara Holmes. Um, should you have any questions? Do, does anyone have any questions? Seeing none, I'll go to Vincent. Vincent, are you here? Yep. And do you need to speak if we're prepared to carry this item? Uh, no need to speak, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. So, committee members, this is uh, the zoning bylaw amendment for 4725 and part of 4623 Spratt Road carried? Carried. Carried. Thank you. And the last one uh, is the exemption. This is a, a Councillor Cloutier report, and it's the exemption to the permanent signs on private property bylaw mural at 1365 Bank Street. And he's asked me yesterday if I would ask you to be kind enough to allow the artist to speak for one minute uh, <laughs> be, be, before we uh, look to carry this item. So um, with that in mind, Councillor Cloutier, would you like to introduce your artist? Madam Chair, thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you uh, planning committee uh, members for indulging me. Uh, I expect that this will will carry on on consent. I would encourage you to uh, to give your support to this report and and arousing encouragement to Claudia Salguero. Um, many of you know her. She is a community engaged and passionate artist about murals and and that carry meaningful messages in, in our community. And in my ward, she's got murals on and another location on Bank Street at Charles Hull School on Russell Road at Sandalwood Park, Conseil Fleury, the murales de Claudia dans, dans son quartier. And, um, and I, I appreciate the indulgence of the chair and committee members. If we could uh, just allow Claudia a, a moment to say hello and to provide context about the mural, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Um, Thank and you. so uh, I would uh, flip it over to Claudia, please. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to say in a very short uh, sentences what the wisdom mural mean to me. And uh, there's a phrase that really describes it and is uh, we are one with nature and one together. And this is what the wisdom mural is about. Indigenous, uh, wis indigenous wisdom from Canada and from around the world invite us to reconnect with mother nature and in a very conscious way so we can secure a better future for our generations to come. And this is what I'm trying to, this is what I'm trying to be an instrument to, right? To, to put those voices and those voices out there. I have created more than four murals with the communities in Ottawa. And I can tell you that uh, the impact in the participants of the creation of my murals and the communities around it is huge. There is a sense of belonging, there is a self-esteem um, increase, there is a interaction within the community and, um, and of course, embellishment. Um, it would be awesome to have your support for the creation of this mural because I think that these days, especially after all that we have gone through, it would be a very, very beautiful reason to look up and to feel hopeful. And, and in that area in the city where we need lots of color, which is uh, in, in that corner of uh, Riverside. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia. So, yeah. committee, um, committee members, is this item carried? Good. Carried. Thank carried. you, Claudia. Thanks very much. Okay, okay everybody, we're going to go you, back Claudia. to the, We'll go back to the beginning to the first held item, which is the first item. And that is the zoning bylaw amendment uh, for 1800 and 1830 Trim Road in um, Cumberland Ward and in Councilor Kitts area. Uh, we do have one person speaking. That is Alitza Palazov. Alitza? Do you see her, Melody? No? She doesn't appear to be here at the moment. Okay, um, what time is it? 9.47. Yeah, well, then I think that we can, I'm not going to call her, but we only have the one speaker and then we have the, uh, um, we have the um, applicant here who's represented by um, Julie Carrera from Fotan, Emily Coyle Fotan, and Connor Sutherland from Mattamy. So, um, do any of you have any questions on the on this item in Councillor Kitt's uh, area ward? No, I don't see any. Okay, I don't see any hands up. So, um, and, oh, no. Um, Melody, while I'm talking and, and offering the uh, applicant, um, if they are prepared to uh, have us vote on this item without speaking. Just let me know if uh, you see Alitza Palazov come forward. And if she does not, hmm? so if she does not, we'll reach out to her to prepare a written submission if she would like. That would be great. Okay, that would be great. Um, so Julie, Emily, and Connor, uh, do you need to speak if we are prepared to carry this item? No, Madam Chair, we do not need to speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julie. So. On um, the zoning bylaw amendment for 1800 and 1830 Trim Road, is that carried? Carried. Yes. Carried. Thank carried. you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. It's a lot easier to come out than it used to be, eh? <laughs> um, the next held item is the zoning bylaw amendment for, for 78, 84, 86, and 88 Beechwood Avenue and 69. 73, 77, 81, 85, 89, and 93 Barrett Street. And um, I know that uh, John Bernie is here and he has a few slides prepared. And I think that I would like him to uh, uh, share those with us. Mr. Bernie, are you here? There you are. Yes, good morning. A, uh, do you have a copy of the melody? Coming up. All right, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to present uh, this item to the members of Planning Committee. So my name is John Bernier and I'm the city planner assigned to this file. 
Um, next slide, please. So the subject site is located along the western edge of Vanier and immediately south of the Linden Lee community. Uh, the dividing line between these communities is Beechwood Avenue, shown here. Uh, next slide, please. So the property in question is assembly of 11 lots that are located mid block between Loyer Street and St. Charles Street. Uh, the development will create a through lot with frontage on both Beechwood Avenue and Barrett Street. Uh, so for reference, the Metro grocery store is located west of the subject site and the eight story St. Charles market development is located uh, to the east. And the site is uh, predominantly surrounded by uh, low-rise residential and commercial buildings. Next slide, please. So the image shown here is uh, of the latest site plan. And uh, the proposed development is for a nine-story mixed-use building with 227 residential dwelling units. And four retail spaces are proposed at grade along Beechwood Avenue. Uh, parking will be completely underground with 158 spaces accessed via Barrett Street off of the mid block connection. And the proposal includes 252 bicycle parking spaces. Uh, there's approximately 3,200 square meters of amenity area provided within the at grade courtyard, six floor communal terrace facing Barrett Street and private balconies. Uh, on the right side of the plan, you'll see the um, there is a wide animated mid-block connection from Beechwood Avenue to Barrett Street, uh, complete with a green wall, street furniture, and commercial patio. Uh, this connection will include garage access, enclosed uh, loading area, and main entrance to the residential components. Next slide, please. So here's the latest uh, perspective drawing of the proposed development looking south from Beechwood Avenue. And you'll notice a, a series of three smaller brick buildings, which establishes a consistent uh, three-story datum line along the frontage. Uh, and this was in to encourage and maintain a pedestrian scale at the street level and to respect the heritage building uh, located at 98 Beechwood, which is pictured on the left side of this image. Uh, next slide, please. So, so here's another perspective image from Beechwood Avenue looking south with a better view of the mid-block connection on the left side of the building. Uh, this image also includes the eastern uh, facade, which the applicant uh, further articulated following the UDRP and staff recommendations. Uh, you also notice a number of step backs included in the design at the fourth, seventh, and ninth uh, stories on, the, on this frontage. And the upper portions of the massing will include a lighter material to take away um, some of the emphasis of the upper portions of the building. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a view looking west down Brett Street from St. Charles Street. Uh, this image best illustrates the multiple step backs provided to achieve a 45 mm -hmm. degree angular plane from the low rise properties on the opposite side of Brett. Um, it's a bit difficult to see in this image, but uh, there will be ground oriented residential units which will have direct access onto that street. And then the, uh, the design uses a variety of high quality materials in various colors to create visual interest at the street. Next slide, please. So through this development, we did secure section 37 contributions in the amount of uh, $738,000 which will be provided through this development. And um, through discussions with the ward counselor, the monies collected will be attributed uh, to the completion of the Beechwood cycle track. And any amounts left over will, will be directed to the ward 12 cycling and pedestrian improvement fund. Next slide. And then there are a number of uh, non-cash contributions which the applicant uh, will be providing through the associated site plan application. And uh, I'll just list a few. So um, they'll be providing and maintaining a mid-block pedestrian pathway connection between Beechwood and Barrett. And uh, this will have a public access easement uh, so that anyone can freely walk through this area. Um, they'll be constructing a right-of-way right improvements, including a cycle track, sidewalk, uh, landscape along their frontage. And this will extend eastward uh, to include the entire frontage of the Heritage Building at 98 uh, Beechwood Avenue. 
You'll also be including a minimum of one to one ratio of units uh, to bicycle parking spaces. Um, they'll be providing traffic calming measures along Brett Street in the form of a bulb out. And the owner will provide uh, opportunity for car sharing on site. And then finally, um, the owner intends to seek uh, lead certification, which um, through discussions I understand is a strong uh, lead silver certification with the potential um, for actually gold certification. And uh, next slide. That's the last slide. Okay, so uh, I welcome any questions that you may have at this point. I don't see any, but I thank you for the presentation. It's, um, uh, we're, we're gonna go to the um, uh, delegates that are here to speak first, and then there might be some questions as well. Our first uh, speaker is Chris Greenshields. He's the vice president of the Vanier Community Association. Chris, welcome. You're, you're, and I should tell everybody that you have five minutes to present everybody that comes before us today. Thanks, Chris, welcome. Thank you, Madam. Is the technical difficulties. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. The Vanier Community Association uh, supports this application, but not in its entirety. We join with other members of the uh, Beechwood Village Alliance in expressing disappointment that the recommendations of the Urban Design Review Panel were not fully implemented, especially with respect to, uh, to heights. That said, uh, this has been uh, a long journey and we thank Minto and Kevin uh, Harper is here uh, for its engagement with the Vanier community and its efforts to address community uh, concerns about the adjoining heritage property, the design approach on Barret, commercial space on Beechwood, together with the setbacks and the stepbacks uh, there. The approach along Barrett uh, serves to better integrate the development into this historic R4 residential area of Vanier with the mid-block mid garage entry and loading dock, the active street entries, the setbacks with front yards, and again, the stepbacks. The mid-block pedestrian corridor connecting Beechwood and Barrett as per the Beechwood uh, Community Development Plan is another welcome step. We welcome also the road modification agreement to extend the cycle track along Beechwood as per the TMP uh, provisions for Beechwood. Similarly, the section 37 investments will provide additional improvements to the cycle track, as well as traffic calming measures along Barret and elsewhere in Vanier. The parks cash in lieu is also important for Vanier. We need more park space and safer spaces. The recent incident with serious injuries to the kids at the Tabor uh, Luxury Apartments, which is, a, as you uh, very well know, uh, a city family shelter, illustrates this urgent need, for example, to address the adjoining Saint-Denis Saint Tabor uh, Parquet, which has been neglected for years and which we are hopeful now that the city will address. Beachwood Village Alliance letter, which I hope you have received, uh, addresses the major concern about the permitted height and the shadowing effects, particularly to the north in Linden Lee. While we recognize that the OPA 150 amendment permits mid-rise buildings up to nine stories on traditional main streets, this is conditioned on minimizing the shadowing efforts and uh, effects and subject to any uh, existing secondary plans. Unfortunately, the Beechwood CDP has no statutory effect in the end, and such heights would not have been permitted had it been a secondary plan. This experience, the impact on the character of, of Beechwood and the resulting shadowing effects illustrates, uh, illustrate why Vanier and the Beechwood area need a secondary plan in addition to the uh, existing Rockcliffe Park secondary plan, which emerged after amalgamation. BCA has proposed with our councillor support such a secondary plan to build on the Montreal Road District secondary plan to cover all areas of Vanier 
and all our traditional main streets. Had we the same rules as the Montreal Road Plan, uh, we would have avoided undermining further the mission of the Beachwood CDP. Thank you very much, Missy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I don't have any questions for you. Thank you. It was a really good uh, um, presentation. Next up, we have Miklos Horbath. Miklos Horbath. Okay. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just go straight into it. I'm a resident of a Beachwood community, and while I support the idea of it, intensification generally, I think that it is vitally important that it be done in a thoughtful manner in order for it to work for the community. I find that the report before us is unbalanced and accentuates the developer's proposal as opposed to being as opposed to providing an objective opinion. The CDP is basically being brushed aside and the UDRP's main suggestion that of reducing the height of the Beachwood and east sides of the development in order to lessen the massing of the building has been hidden in the annex. The building will have the largest footprint of any on Beechwood. It will be taller than all but except, except the Kavanaugh, which is the, at the far eastern side of Beechwood, which is well set back, set back from the street and with a much smaller footprint. The other mid-rise mid buildings along Beechwood were granted greater heights due to the fact that they occupy corner lots, which allow for greater heights to be requested. The proposal in front of us is not <clears throat> on a corner lot. It is a mid-block development. It is a nine-story building that occupies nearly half a city block and that has no other buildings on that block higher than three-story, with the majority being one and two stories. I am at a loss to understand who would think that such this proposal would be suitable for this community and that a nine-story building would be generally comply, that would generally comply with a low-rise community. In fact, the proposal would be better suited to Saint Laurent, Maryvale, Innes, or Strandherd with curb-to-curb -curb measurements that match our apparent right-of-way of 24 meters, not a winding main street that is approximately 13 meters across in a low-rise established community. With that said, I do not support this application in the current form. However, I believe that the proposal does have some positive elements that are consistent with the CDP and the urban design guidelines for traditional main streets. For example, the barrette side of the development is not overbearing as, and is in fact human in scale at six stories or approximately 20 meters in height. It has relatively large setbacks of 8.5 meters on the sixth floor, 7.2 on the west side of the building. And the setbacks and heights of the barrette side allow for the 45 degree angular plane, which is a planning tool used to assess the appropriate height transition between the proposed and the existing low rise buildings. Unfortunately, these positives I've just noted on the Barrett side do not translate into the Beechwood side and are in fact not consistent at all with the CDP, which calls for lower level buildings of up to four stories, more significant step backs for higher floors, as well as the breaking up of the facades to provide more of a village feel. Just to remind you, the Beechwood side is proposed at nine stories or approximately 30 meters, not including the mechanical building, uh, buildings, which would bring the total height to above 34 meters. It would be the tallest building directly facing Beechwood. The step backs on this much higher section of the building range from 1.1 to 4.2 meters at the ninth floor. This is a far cry from 8.5 meters on the sixth floor on the Barrett side. <clears throat> I must ask why the Barrett side is consistent with the intent of the provision or the guidelines, and yet not on the Beechwood side. The planner has used the planning tool for the 45 degree hang, uh, angle, angular plane, uh, to assess the appropriate height transition between the proposed uh, and existing low rise buildings, but not on the north side. This makes no sense to me. Um, throughout this report, the uh, the development is referred to being generally consistent with the guidelines with ample setbacks and stepbacks being provided to create human scale and reduce shadowing impacts. Well, I agree with the statement for the Barrett side, but not at all for the Beechwood side. In fact, I find that the shadowing uh, piece on the uh, Beechwood side indicates that the shadows would disappear in the winter time by 11 a.m. I believe this to be factually incorrect and, the, and further evidence that the report is inaccurate and downplays the reality. It also has no mention of the fact that the sidewalk on the north side of Beechwood will be in shadow until 1 p.m. in midwinter. 
in that approximately 50%, uh, sorry, the shadowing uh, uh, goes further than 50% of the as of right shadowing that it is allowed. Um, uh, also, um, I've heard from re residents characterizing the impact of having this this uh, development on our main street as uh, being a container ship or a cruise ship dropped in the middle of our community. So to conclude, I ask that you deny the zoning request and ask the developer to come back with a more modest design on the Beechwood side of the development, something that is more in line with the Barrett side would go a long way to satisfying myself and the impacted residents of Beechwood Avenue. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. And um, your councillor has uh, his hand up, Councillor Fleury. Just to be clear, uh, Councillor Harder, uh, Mikolos' council would be Councillor King. We, our, our boundary is right on Beechwood, and I think Mikolos oh. presents uh, the north side here. So, did you uh, did you tell me that uh, Nicholas that you were? I mean, it's they are they are brushed up against each other. We have that all over the city. I didn't hear. We share, uh, we share a wonderful Main Street, uh, I'm sure. Yes, and, you do. Okay, go uh, ahead. Mikolos, my my question to you is, we we've seen we've seen Beechwood. Uh, continue to transform and I'd say generally from my perspective it's been really good additions the domicile at the Kavanaugh has been great the St. Charles market has been applauded the Minto's first development was well received what do you feel is so different with this one because I actually think from a design point of view that Minto really stepped it up uh, in, in uh, from from what from what we've seen along the corridor so I, I get the technicality that you're describing I'm just from what we've seen over the last, you know, last 10 years, there's been some really good addition. I think from my perspective, this one does add, uh, does, does align with those, uh, the, the goals. So can you maybe speak to what issues you've seen with the previous development that would continue to build on to this one? Thank you, Matthew. Uh, well, I, I find that I'm not sure that the, those other developments you uh, mentioned have actually been well received. I think they've been maybe well, well received by the development community, but I'm not sure of the actual residents who live there. I know that the Rockcliffe residents fought the Kavanaugh uh, uh, development. I know that people were not happy with the St. Charles development going up, and it seems to be going up higher than was originally proposed. Um, I thought it was supposed to stop at six or seven stories, and now it's gone to eight. Um, the Minto one, as we call it, um, that's right against the street. There's no setbacks. The sidewalk is not as um, as uh, wide as uh, we had hoped. Uh, the step backs, there are no step backs until you reach, I think, the fifth or sixth story, and that's about a meter or two. Um, the New Edinburgh residence, I think, is a better example of a development that is very tall, but it has, I don't know the exact uh, metrics, but it must be 15 to 20 meters back the tower part from the actual main street. So that on the main street, it's about a two, it's about a two story height building. And then it goes far, far back before it starts to rise again. The issue with this building um, is that it's sort of a tale of two cities. It's the, the Barrette side, which I agree with it. It, it looks, I think it fits. It, it's, it's stepped back quite substantially as I, as I mentioned it rises up to a maximum of six stories. On the Beechwood side, it doesn't, it basically goes straight up. Yes, it go, it, there's a few setbacks at, at about up to four, I think I said four meters, just over four meters, but it's basically straight up to the, from, from the street. And that's causing a huge shadowing effect. It is ma it's a massive building. It's bigger than the Minto One building in terms of the, the length. Um, as I mentioned, it's the largest building on, footprint on on the street it's a main it's a mid block uh development whereas all the others are on corners they're on corner lots which permitted slightly higher uh heights the the Kavanaugh which is the highest one is actually in between two streets right and it is set back further as well I appreciate you what you're saying uh thank you me close madam chair I'll, I'll I'll hold my comments till the end and, and certainly speak to uh to why I feel it is a, uh, an important improvement, but I, I appreciate what you're saying, Nicholas. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, sir, for coming out. Um, next up, we have uh, Paul Black is here from FOTEN and Kevin Harper from Minto. Paul? I believe I have a presentation another thing to bring up. Thank you. 
Thank you, Melody. Uh, yes, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Paul Black. I'm a senior planner at FOTEN Plan Design. Uh, here with me this morning is Kevin Harper, Director of Infill at Minto. Um, we'd like to thank uh, staff, uh, John, for um, his presentation. Um, I'll keep our presentation fairly brief and just address some of the comments uh, that you've heard uh, from members of the community here this morning. Um, Minto, uh, through Kevin Harper, uh, has uh, engaged significantly or extensively, I should say, with the community over the course of this zoning amendment application um, with uh, the community associations as well as the Beachwood Village Alliance, um, with the public through public meetings, the Urban Design Review Panel, uh, city staff, and with local councillors. Um, the result uh, of those meetings has resulted in significant changes to the building since its original inception um, and results in the building before you today, which uh, in my opinion is highly articulated and uh, contextually sensitive building um, that's appropriate for the site and will provide a significant intensification along uh, a target area for intensification within the city. Um, next slide, please. So we heard from we heard from John on the location of the site. Uh, it is along the uh, I'll call it the south side of Beechwood um, Avenue uh, between Loyer and St. Charles. Uh, it is a mid-block site, as um, we've just heard. Um, but it is along a corridor that is experiencing significant change. Uh, next slide, Melody. So the proposal is a nine-story building, um, 227 units. Um, with 158 underground parking spaces. Um, it is divided into sort of two wings with a connecting uh, element uh, with uh, wings on Beechwood and Barrett Street. Uh, here you can see the corridor. Uh, yellow buildings represent uh, buildings either under construction in the case of St. Charles Market or uh, already built. Uh, so those include the Kavanaugh, the Minto, uh, Minto One, I guess. Um, <laughs> Uh, as well as some other more uh, older buildings that have been uh, in existence and are taller. Um, there are other uh, proposals for development along the corridor. Um, across the street is one um, around the Desjardins Bank and then also other potential developments here shown in blue uh, for how the site, uh, we see the corridor developing over time. The site is a designated traditional main street, which as we've heard, uh, is a target area for intensification. It also, uh, in the official plan, is recognized as supporting mid-rise building heights of five to nine stories. Um, and it calls for developments to be compact, mixed use, and pedestrian oriented. Um, the property is also subject to the Beechwood CDP uh, and is within the village mixed use area. And the CDP speaks to buildings generally being within four to six stories, as we've heard. Um, but does recognize that greater intensification is uh, will be considered in certain conditions. And those were aligned in the staff report as well, but include things uh, like access to sunlight being maintained, um, complementing the character, the village character, uh, as well as vertical distinctions uh, within the building. Next slide, please. So as we've seen, if this is the uh, Beechwood Avenue frontage of the building, which uh, is highly articulated with setbacks, um, like was mentioned above the third story, above the uh, uh, sixth story, and uh, above the eighth story, setting the nine story portion of the building back a total of nine meters from the property line. The ground floor of the building also features a four and a half meter setback um, to accommodate a cycle track and wide pedestrian sidewalk. So addressing some of the comments that um, the last speaker uh, noted to create a, a really what we hope will be an excellent public realm along the frontage uh, with retail spaces animating the sidewalk and, uh, and specifically a retail space at the, at the corner of the building adjacent to the uh, Heritage Building at 98 Beachwood and the proposed mid-block connection through to Barrett Street. Uh, in terms of uh, shadow impacts, um, ju just looking at the next slide. Uh, so we have examined the shadow impacts as with any development application uh, with a fair bit of detail, uh, specifically with the properties uh, along um, Command Way and Douglas Avenue. Um, here you can see in the uh, fall and uh, spring, uh, shadows, those properties are out of shadow by 10 a.m. Uh, next slide. In the summer months, uh, or sorry, in the winter, uh, those properties are out of shadow by, um, by noon approximately. Um, and then looking at the north side of Beechwood Avenue on the next slide, 
um, and the sidewalk there, as was noted, the, the sidewalk would be out of shadow completely by 1 p.m. in the fall uh, and uh, spring, and then in the winter by 2 p.m. on the next line. And during the summer months, the, the yards would be completely out of shadow. I, I believe that was my time, Melody. Yes, so thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, on any of these points or others. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Leeper? Uh, a quick question, Paul. Can you show me the west elevation? Uh, we've been taking a look at Beechwood, but I, I just want to try to understand those setbacks a bit better. Uh, the Barrett Street elevation? Uh, so the elevation of the uh, looking at the property from the, um, from the west. Uh, so I am afraid I don't have that in my presentation. Um, I can tell you that uh, on that west side, uh, the building does feature uh, similar articulation. So the three-story brick podium um, uh, that's present along Beechwood wraps around the corner um, with a setback above the third story of 2.9 meters and above the sixth story of uh, 2.4 meters up to the nine story portion. Um, that frontage obviously does protect at the lower floors, especially where there's a zero meter lot line for future development of the um, retail plaza uh, to the immediate west. Um, and then as it steps back, allows for additional uh, windows um, uh, fronting that, uh, that frontage. I guess uh, my, what I was hoping to see was the Beechwood frontage that you're showing us with the uh, three-dimensional rendering seems to show, you know, a fair bit of uh, reticulation on there. But each one of those step backs, at least as far as the zoning schedule shows, is, is relatively minimal. Uh, you know, it's, I'm looking at it a meter and a half, a meter and a half. Um, I'm really concerned that this one is going to be, as Mr. Miklos described, going up nine stories almost without relief um, and so I'm trying to get a feel for what those you know 1.6 and then 1.5 step backs are actually going to feel like and we're not getting that from the three-dimensional rendering that we're seeing from the Beechwood side um, and of course you know this is an even narrower right-of-way than we have on uh, Wellington Street for example and you know we're forever trying to avoid the same mistake that was made with the property uh, between Hilson and, and and Island Park. I'm worried that this one is just going straight up. Can I can I just uh, suggest? I think in the package that John Bernier presented, there was a better shot from the west side. At least um, it showed the Heritage Building to the left, to the west. Yeah, that that stuck out in my mind as giving, um, I think, you know, a good uh, concept of what you're asking about right now, Councillor Leeper. Yeah, it's, the 3D is always tricky. Um, and this is a mid block at, at nine stories. And, you know, I can understand nine stories at the at a gateway corner, and I'll probably be supporting one of those It's coming up uh, probably relatively soon. But mid block nine stories is a lot to ask the street to take particularly on such a narrow right-of-way um i i'm not comfortable with it for the moment but uh chair i'll i'll uh, continue to listen to the uh, to the discussion but sorry paul did you want to respond to that at all yeah i saw you were yeah. jumping in uh, well yeah it's true madam chair i mean yes there are um it is there are smaller setbacks on the beachwood side than are on the west side of the building um However, the building is, like I mentioned, set back uh, a fair bit from a, and providing a significantly wider sidewalk than would exist uh, today. And then uh, the, really the three-story datum line we've worked through with uh, UDRP and with staff is intended to provide that sort of at grade experience of pedestrian character, which as you'll know, uh, Council Leeper in the traditional Main Street, it calls for a, a setback above the, uh, above the fourth story as minimum. Um, so we're providing that at the third story and then in certain areas that setback is provided at a almost a three meter step back in other areas it is reduced to 1.25 um, and that's really to 
provide further articulation to the building and to provide further um, interest in the facade. Um, but it does provide a significant separation to anything above uh, six stories. So there is a three meter setback to anything above the sixth story, um, pushing and pushing even further back for the uh, ninth story as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I see that um, um, Mr. Bernier had his hand up, but um, I can't go to you until we're, 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 you know, we just have our rules. So I will go to you if there are no other questions. Are you, um, is that it for you, Councillor Leeper? Sorry to interrupt. No, no, I, I will continue the conversation with John. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Paul. And Kevin, um, John was, uh, um, um, was speaking for both of you. Sorry, Madam Chair. John, I just want or... to make sure that, you know, I have you down here. I just want to make sure that you didn't want to say something as well. Well, I think John and, and Paul have, have covered uh, the details of this very well. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, I, have, I have a couple of minor comments, so. Go ahead. So my first is, you know as well as I do that infill development is complicated because it, it means change. Change in the urban fabric, change in the built form, um, and change in the community. Uh, it's also expensive and it's time consuming for a lot of reasons. Um, it, it demands strong commitment to community engagement. It demands significant contribution to the public realm. It demands quality architectural design and materials. And it demands an appropriate transition to the surrounding streets and buildings. Um, and this is a lot to demand of any project. Um, and you see this every other week. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that's to say that it cannot be achieved. And I'd like to think that we've dotted the I's and, and crossed the T's on this one. Um, but I do realize that not everyone will agree. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any more um, hands up. So uh, thank you uh, for everyone who is uh, speaking today. And now I, I, I'll go to uh, John Bernier, the uh, planner, he, he had something to say. Um, and then uh, go ahead. And then uh, Councillor Fleury has this hand up. John? Right, yeah, it was just a point of clarification. The, uh, uh, Madam Chair, the Council had mentioned these setbacks and the zoning schedule. Will these uh, setbacks, and, sorry, setbacks and setbacks actually represent minimums? So the, the actual design of the building itself will be slightly a uh, step back further than what's shown on that uh, schedule. Obviously not just by a significant amount, but uh, you know, uh, larger than what, uh, what they have there on that schedule. Okay, hey, thank you for that. Councillor Fleury? And then, I'm not Councillor. If it's okay, I'd love to hold my comments until it all questions are asked. If, if okay, I didn't. Well, when I called you the first time, I didn't have anybody else asking questions. So Apologize. now we have Vice Chair Gower, and then I'm going to go to you and and, and questions and and wrap up. Uh, Councillor Vice Chair Gower. Yeah, I just questions? have a quick. I have a quick question about the Section 37. So it's 738 thousand dollars that will go towards cycling, and I, I understand part of that's a cycle track, basically in front of the building, but could you clarify, like, I'm, I'm not clear on where exactly the cycle track is going to be installed. Is it the entire block or just part of the block? Sorry, is that a question directed to me? I, th I think so, yes, in yep. terms of the, yeah, yep. details. I can answer that. Section. So um, we are working with the yeah. central. John, yeah. can you try, I don't know if anyone else here at Pine, yeah, okay. Can you turn your picture off, please, and try just to give us your voice? Okay. This is very uh, sketchy. Okay. Now try. My apologies. Uh, my wife is also okay. working upstairs. Turn your picture uh, back on because it's it's not better. Okay. All right. Just uh, let me know if, if you need me to repeat any of the information that I'm, uh, that I'm just presenting. Just say it quickly. Okay. <laughs> So yes, there, there is a cycle track proposed along the frontage of the property and we hope to get um, um, as much of uh, the cycle track constructed between Loyer, Loyer and uh, St. Charles. Um, okay. But the, 
But Minto, Minto is going to be building an entire, their entire length um, or width of their property uh, plus the heritage building. And just procedurally, is, are the details around that determined through the zoning or is that through the site plan or what stage of the process do you actually determine exactly how that money gets spent uh, in relation to the cycle path or other aspects of this? Uh, that, that'll be determined through uh, site plan. The, the design of that, so, um, we pretty much have a, a solid design uh, selected for the frontage. Um, we're just uh, going through the site plan team to determine how the um, uh, cycle track should look like, uh, look in front of the uh, quickie uh, building to the west. So okay. um, in order to avoid expropriation, we need to design um, within the current extent of the right of way. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Thank you. Okay, over, just let me check. Okay, over to you, uh, Councillor Fleury. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I recognize all of the, uh, the zoning provisions. I, I, I take a bigger look at the corridor. So there is, uh, as Beachwood is a main street, uh, there is a protected view plane from Poets Hill, which is at the Beachwood Cemetery, to the Peace Tower. And that is really guided and will guide what is permitted along the corridor. We've seen where developments have happened, where they're happening, how buildings are shaped and so on, based on that view plane. I think we've generally uh, benefited from increase in commercial spaces, ground floor. We've uh, increased the population along Beachwood, which have all been uh, well received. In this particular context, I wanna to bring to your attention a few things. One, which is the current status of the property. And I hate to go back pre mental ownership, but there are a couple of properties that have, that have historic consideration. If, if you recall the Lozon family, which unfortunately is, is uh, the, the, uh, the father is deceased, but he was the, they were the owners of that site. There'd mm. been a number of vacancies. There'd been a number of vacant, vacant sites to the lot. We want to see a complete main street with commercial ground floor. That's what, that's what this project's all about. I'm really happy to see that Minto is going back to uh, um, rental environments. This is a rental building. This is a rental building on a main street, a very desirable main street in Ottawa. Uh, the provisions of, you know, there's a couple of additional heights. It's to make the pro forma work. I know it's mid block, but there is a protected heritage building to the, uh, to the east. So there's very limited development rights. And, you know, I was worried that Minto was trying to capture it because you didn't, we didn't want to lose what was the old El Maison. That building is protected. They moved it back. So there's also a plaza in between that heritage building and the building itself. And then on the other side, it's a quickie. It's a one-story quickie with front yard parking. So that, that's kind of the southern, southern components uh, to the lot. It's, it's an important, it's an important uh, service, the kind of grocery corner store condition, but um, there's limited, they, they haven't been able to acquire it. So, you know, I, there's always issues with applications, uh, but I, I, wanna, I want to applaud Kevin and the group. I think they've, they've made this project work. They've worked well with the community. And from my perspective, the, the last kind of tie-in, which was I was super happy with and want to thank John about it, was they're only obligated to do the cycling track within the, their area, but they were missing the connection to St. Charles and Nuayi. And with the, the way the Section 37s worked out, we can now have a much bigger sort of active transportation so that the actual roadway curb will, will push onto the street and will gain that uh, cycling track for the full block will gain more safety along the pedestrian realm. So again, I, I, I recognize the technicality of, of, of some of those elements, but I think overall, it is a, a desirable development along uh, Beachwood Corridor. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Fleury. Okay, now, um, Ms. Duffany, um, was I reading correctly the note that we got from Alexander? That, is there a change to the technical amendment? There was a typo. I have the corrected version. Okay. So are you aware of that, Vice Chair Gower? 
Yes, uh, discovered a typo in one of the section numbers. So it's just fixing one character, but it doesn't change any of the other content. Okay, so do you, since you've already introduced it, would you like to uh, explain what the one uh, letter is? Or Oh, yes, it was 3B, it should be 3BIX, so 3B9, so it's correct as written. There was an extra Roman numeral one in the original. Are you the one that picked up on this? I did, because I translated it as eight, and anyways. Could, could be a new Ro career. Roman numerals. <laughs> could be a new career for you. Yep. Okay, so we have the technical amendment with a very, very small um, change to it. And um, I'm going to call a recorded vote on the item itself, but not on the technical amendment. So on the technical amendment, uh, committee members, is that uh, carried? Carried. 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 And Melody, can you take that off the screen now, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, so on, on the, uh, the item itself, which is zoning bylaw amendment for 78, 84, 86, and 88 Beechwood Avenue, and 69, 73, 77, 81, 85, 89, and 93 Barrett Street. And that is um, as amended. I'm going to uh, call it for recorded vote. Uh, Councilor Brockington. Okay. Councilor Cloutier. Yes. Councilor Dudas. Yes. Councilor Hubley. Yeah. Councilor Yes. Kim. Yeah, sorry, having okay. trouble. Yes. Councilor Leeper. Yes. Councillor Moffat? Yes. Councillor Sides? Yes. Councillor Tierney? Yes. I don't think uh, Councillor Alshantiri is here. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Gower? Yes. And myself? That's a yes. So that's 10 votes um, in favor. Okay. Thank you. All right. And that is all she wrote today. So um, we have no in-camera items. Any notices of motion from anyone? No? Any inquiries? I don't think there's any other business. So we're adjourned and we're back again hard at it on June the 24th. Um, Melody, how many um, meetings, are, are we just having one meeting in July? July 8th. July 8th. It's on the horizon. Okay, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, everyone.